Hello, my beautiful friends, and welcome back to Roots and Refuge Farm. Today, I wanna to talk to you guys about why vertical gardening just makes sense and how easy it actually is. So if you do a quick search online for vertical gardening, it's gonna come back up with a lot of really cute ideas. Things like pots suspended on a wall or gutters built on a stair step structure. Um, all kinds of really great ideas for growing plants upwards. However, if what you have in mind is gardening up for production, little pots aren't really going to be what you're looking for. I found in a lot of my research that when I was looking for vertical gardening information and inspiration, when it came to edibles, there wasn't really just a whole lot out there. So what exactly is vertical gardening? Um, it's growing things up, pretty much. It doesn't have to be fancy, it's just growing things up instead of allowing them to ramble around on the ground. So the first big question about doing that would be why? Why would you want to train your food to grow up? Well, there are a few really good reasons. First, space. I mean, the footprint of this squash plant, if it were grown rambling across the ground, would be about 20 square feet. You would have to allot that much space in your garden for that single plant. However, by growing it up and over this arched trellis, um, it's sharing a bed space with this pineapple ground cherry, with these cherry tomatoes um, over on this side which the, this is one seed, one plant on this. It's planted down in this corner. Um, over on this side where it's growing down, there are more plants, tomatoes, and another ground cherry, some herbs. And now this plant is growing um, over this walkway. So the footprint gets reduced from 20 square feet to, I mean, almost none. I mean, it's literally allotted just a few square feet on both sides where the trellis is. And other than that, it's just covering the walkway, adding beauty to the garden. The second benefit of vertical gardening is how much easier it makes harvesting. Um, for instance, these cucumbers, they're right here at a waist height. So I get to just stand here and pick them. Picking stuff when it's upright is so much easier on your back and your knees. This is a whole lot easier than crawling around on the ground looking for your fruit underneath all the leaves. And it uh, puts your food up right in front of you so you're not as likely to miss fruits. I don't know about you, but I know that um, even with Vertical Garden, I occasionally get surprised by a huge cucumber or something that I completely miss but I know that when I was growing um, things on the ground I was much more frequently surprised by fruits that had been hidden underneath the foliage. The third benefit of vertical gardening is it makes for much healthier plants. Whenever you've got your plants trained up a trellis they're not lying there in the dirt. Um, they're not getting splash back from watering and rain up on the leaves, therefore they're not staying moist. Moist foliage and your plants getting dirty like that, that's a huge recipe for bacterial and fungal infections, uh, blights, wilts. And when your fruit is hanging up off the ground, um, it's out of the reach of little critters that would like to come along and eat it before you get a chance to. The last benefit of vertical gardening is just that it's beautiful. It adds line and structure to the design of your garden while being completely functional. It puts your food on display um, so that you can come out and enjoy it as it grows. And it makes for spaces that are just interesting and engaging as well as very productive. So we can agree that vertical gardening is definitely functional. It's definitely aesthetically pleasing, but is it economical? Well, like with most things, it really depends on how you go about it. There are going to be different kinds of trellises for all different kinds of price ranges. Now, I really don't think it's necessary to go to a home center and buy trellises that are marketed to gardeners for the purpose of trellising. Um, I just don't think it's feasible. I don't think it's functional. Um, but 
You don't have to take my word for it. Let's go check out exactly how expensive buying vertical trellises can be. I chose to check prices at the Home Depot because this is where I come and buy things when I need them for my homestead. Obviously, things would be even more expensive if you were to go to something like a specialty garden center. And I figured this would be a good place to look to find what the low end of prices on something like this would be. Okay, here we have some decorative trellises. Uh, the 72 inch one is $35.98. Um, I don't see, oh yeah, $34.98 on this 80 inch scroll trellis. Um, these hooks here are $12.78 each. Here are just these regular like a pot trellis for $10, a fan trellis for $15. Now obviously, if you were deciding to go that route, things would add up really quickly um, if you were growing much of anything at all because you know one of those 80 inch trellises could probably uh, handle like a cucumber plant so if you're looking at doing any sort of canning or if you are supporting a uh, you know a large family off your garden it's just not going to be feasible at all to come by trellises for that scale of production I'm looking for fencing if you're wondering what my little back and forth dance is. I'm not finding it. Found it. I was on the wrong end of the store. Alright, so now let's talk about what else you could use. Instead of buying trellises that are packaged for the purpose of trellising plants. Now I understand that some people may have a completely different goal. For me they may want a really um, pretty garden where everything is um, fancy it may be uh, beneficial to them to have some sort of trellises that are very elaborate or decorative um, I give you that that is beautiful However, in the case of my garden, it was for me a matter of how do I make it as functional and productive as possible while keeping the price point as low as possible and then within that making it beautiful. So just really quick, let's look at some of these fencing materials that they have here um, at Home, Home Depot. Another reason why I came here is because this is more widely available as far as uh, looking at the price points. Whereas, you know, if I go to my local farmer's co-op, they might have a really great deal, but it's not available to most of you. So here we have a 50 foot row of welded wire for $35. That's 50 feet for $35. That's 600 inches. So for pretty much the same price point of getting 80 inches of vertical trellising space, if you buy a pre-made trellis that is, that is packaged to you for the purpose of trellising plants, you can get 600 inches of a material that um, everything I've ever grown would climb just fine on this. Now, you have to unroll it, you have to cut it, you have to attach it to something to stand it upright. Um, we have typically used T-posts for this. They run three to five dollars each depending on how tall they are. Here are T-posts. Down here we've got a five foot U-post for four dollars. Um, six foot T-post for four forty-eight. Obviously these are really affordable options. Here is a six foot uh, steel T-post for three seventy-eight. Here's um, chicken wire. Now chicken wire doesn't isn't going to hold up as long as these welded wire fencing materials or cattle panels which are my favorite things to use for trellises but I'm trying to show some other options since I know not everybody has those available to them but uh, this is like a coated chicken wire PVC coated green poultry netting $20 for a 25 foot roll it's two feet wide and you could quite simply take all kinds of frames and attach chicken wire and create some sort of trellis. You could take an old bed frame, you could take an old window frame, you could take a pallet and knock out some of the center boards and just staple some chicken wire and prop it up. What you're trying to create is just some sort of sturdy framework for your plants to be able to grab hold of and grow up. Now my preferred route is obviously cattle panels. Uh, we we call these cattle panels. They come in 18 
foot uh, pieces. This is what we've made our arches out of. If you haven't seen our video on that, you can check it out. I'll put the link in the bio. You can cut these. We use bolt cutters in order to cut them and configure them in all different kinds of ways. They might be sold as hog panels, livestock panels, um, but if you call any sort of like farm supply store, tractor supply, anything like that, and describe this, what you're looking for, cattle panels, hog panels, they'll know what you're talking about. They are only 20 to $25 each. I've had some people tell me in their area that they're 30 plus dollars. Um, even with that being the case, it is more um, economical than buying pre-made trellises that are sold for the purpose of gardening. But let's say you don't have the budget to go out and buy cattle panels. Um, that doesn't mean vertical gardening is out of the question for you. There are a lot of ways that you can create trellises um, on a budget by using found materials. One good way to get materials if you cannot afford to buy them is find out if anyone in your area has any fencing that they no longer want. Um, gates, fencing, fence posts, all of that stuff. A lot of times people are looking to get rid of stuff like that, but they just need someone to haul it off or come take it down. Yeah, that's a little bit of labor, but if it saves you a whole lot of money, it's worth it. This trellis, um, which we have tomatoes growing up right now, it's just a piece of six foot fence that we unrolled and attached to some T-posts. They're all mixed matched heights. And we're gonna grow tomatoes up this. Two pieces of uh, a dog crate that someone gave us because the door on it was broken. Those sat back in our um, kind of our junk for a while. And I finally brought them up here and I'm growing squash on them. Here's a gate. Um, I'm pretty sure someone gave this to us because they said, you know, hey, we're about to put this out at the side of the road. We replaced our fencing and we thought maybe you could do something with it. So we picked that up. We used zip ties to connect everything. All of this, all of these are materials which are affordable. They're pretty easy to put together. It doesn't take, um, doesn't take any grand carpentry skills to drive a T-post and attach a, you know, a gate or a piece of metal fencing to that T-post with zip ties. But let's say that you are not in a place where you can get those things. Say you don't have a truck or you don't have the ability to move the, maneuver these big panels by yourself. Back before I had this garden and before I had all of these trellises, I grew peas and beans, uh, pole beans and climbing peas by just putting a few uh, T-posts in the ground and running clothesline between them. It just gave the peas and the beans something to climb up. It worked wonderfully. At the end of the season, I did have to take it down, whereas these things you put up and you could leave them up for years if you wanted to. So what can you grow vertically? Pole beans. Um, these particular ones are called noodle beans, runner beans, any sort of climbing bean. You don't even have to coax them. Just plant them at the base of a trellis like this and they do the rest. This is especially beneficial if you don't have a large garden and you don't have the space to grow a whole lot of bush beans or rows of beans. You can grow way more beans on one pole bean plant than one bush bean plant. Because essentially, when it comes to beans, a pole bean is the equivalent of an indeterminate tomato, whereas a bush bean is the equivalent of a determinate variety. It means that as long as you continue to provide support for them and keep those plants healthy, they will continue to put off flowers and therefore put off more beans. Whereas a bush bean has a determined amount of flowers and a determined amount of beans. When they're done, they're done. A pole bean, however, will keep producing throughout the season. So if you've got a small amount of space, you benefit way more from growing a row of pole beans than you do a row of bush beans. But you have to provide them some sort of trellising to keep them upright so they stay healthy, so they continue to produce, and so you can continue to harvest them throughout the season, forcing them to produce more. Another natural climber is uh, cucumbers. Just like these here. Cucumber plants, if you grow them at the base of a trellis, they will grab hold of that trellis with their tendrils and just take off. Now you might have to catch little runaways like this and kind of train it back up by tucking the leaves through the trellis. 
and keep an eye on them because they have a tendency to grab hold of their neighbors and can choke out other plants. However, they are super easy to grow on a trellis and by growing them upwards, you avoid a lot of the blights and the funguses, powdery mildew, and the kind of things that often take out cucumber plants because they're up off the ground and therefore the foliage stays dry. So pole beans, which include fresh eating, uh, dried beans, runner beans, peas, I don't have any of those growing right now because it's too hot for them here, but we have grown many peas and all these different kinds of trellises. Another thing you can grow on a trellis is melons. Um, they are also natural climbers, which that they have tendrils, which kind of grab hold of the trellis and take off. And growing melons vertically, you do sometimes have to offer some sort of support. Um, as you can see here, this particular melon is in pantyhose. It's just kind of playing around with that. Um, some of these are not supported right now, and they're doing okay. However, for a bigger melon, like a watermelon or anything um, that's going to have a lot of weight to it, you would want to offer it some support to keep the stems from breaking when they start getting brittle towards the end of the melon ripening. Tomatoes. Tomatoes are not natural climbers. They actually will naturally just kind of sprawl out along the ground and grow more roots if they're given the chance. Indeterminate tomatoes, like I was talking about the beans, they will grow as long as you will provide support for them. And most tomato cages are like 32, 36 inches tall. The, like the jumbo tomato cages, they are, you know, maybe 48 inches tall. These trellises are four feet cattle panels, which we have suspended up about 20 inches. Now they're in raised beds, so as you can see, these trellises are quite a lot taller than me, and these plants are quite a lot taller than the trellises. See, if we will provide more space to grow up, we will get more tomatoes. They stay healthier, it promotes airflow. So vertical gardening, um, this, this extends to things that we might not even think about. Things like tomatoes, if, if we give them the space to grow up, they will. And in that, that increases your harvest, which is the point of growing this stuff in the first place. What about the subject of squash? Well, let's take a look here. This is called a warded Incan cream puff squash, which is a large variety of winter squash. Now, my first year to have a big garden with a lot of uh, vertical trellises, I had read a blog that basically said that you could train um, summer squash to grow up bush summer squash specifically like zucchinis yellow crooknecks so i tried it and um it wasn't great now here is a big healthy uh bush squash plant and if you look in here i'll show you how this grows it's got one long stalk that comes up from the uh, ground, and then all of these leaves that come off of it. So technically, yes, you could train this to grow up. However, in my experience, it's really not worth it. Um, that stalk, this is, a, this is a pretty mature plant. This has been in producing for almost six weeks now. Um, that's, that's pretty long for a summer squash. And from the ground to the end of that stalk is maybe 30 inches. That's, that's not very long. Um, that plant is doing just fine allowing it to bush. Now if you had a really limited space, you could train that main stalk up like a T-post or something like that by tying it off. However, um, it did not want to go up and it would take daily coming out and training that, tying it up every single day and making sure all the new growth is being trained to go up in order for that to grow that way. Um, I decided that wasn't worth it for me. If you wanted to try it, you know, more power to you, I think that you could do it. I just don't know that it's necessarily worth it because the thing is, is those leaves are still gonna branch out really far. It's still gonna have those huge leaves on those long stems and it's still gonna take up, you know, a radius of a couple of feet, even if it was trained up on a center stalk. So I don't really know if that was really worth it. However, winter squash varieties like 
this warded ink and cream puff. Now this is the main stalk of the warded ink and cream puff. And this is one plant from one seed. And it comes all the way over and all the way down. One winter squash plant can take up almost 20 square feet if allowed to trail along the ground. By putting this one plant on this arch trellis, I've minimized the footprint greatly. So it's not taking up a huge portion of the garden. It's actually just growing over the walkway here. Now, vining winter squashes like this one, they, um, they do have tendrils and they will climb. However, they kind of just go wherever and you have to just sort of train them back. Now I check on this squash daily and whenever little branches like this kind of take off, I just sort of run it back through this trellis. And in doing so, we've managed to keep this uh, squash on this trellis and it's covering almost the entire thing. The plant is healthy. Um, it's not being riddled by any sort of like powdery mildew or anything like that. And when the squash that it puts off start getting really big, I'll provide it some support with either pantyhose or like a plastic produce bag. And that allows me to grow a winter squash plant in a raised bed. Whereas if you didn't grow them somehow up and out of the way, you might not be able to do that at all. When it comes to growing squash, the real question that you need to figure out if you're trying to decide if it is going to need vertical support is whether it is a bush habit or a vining habit. Um, many winter squashes are vining habits. However, there are some that are bush habits and most summer squashes are bush habits. So you just kind of have to look in it, into it whenever you buy your seeds which kind of squash you're dealing with and therefore you'll know if it is something that can be trained to a trellis. Now obviously on these plants that have heavier fruit like a winter squash or a watermelon, these are going to require a sturdier trellis whereas with peas or beans that's where you can really uh, utilize like a string trellis. You could even probably do that with some smaller cucumber varieties. You'd have no problem using uh, you know, clothesline or twine or something that you had tied up very tightly that had a lot of good tension and strength and support. I've actually found it really surprising that more people don't grow things vertically. However, I think that a lot of people are discounting that as an option because they simply think it's gonna be a lot of work uh, to establish or a large financial investment, which it doesn't have to be. I really do believe that so many people could benefit from growing their plants vertically um, and just have a more successful and enjoyable gardening experience. Now it might take some resourceful thinking and a little bit more work on the front end to get it established, but I really do believe that it can be a huge help in having a more successful growing year. If you have any questions about this, please put it down in the comments. I'll be happy to um, help you. And if we get a whole lot of questions, I might do another video kind of explaining that stuff. But um, I, really, I really do wanna encourage you guys to look around at the resources that you have and think about implementing some of these things in your own garden. I really hope this helps you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time.